Okay, good morning. Everyone can grab the seat. I guess this turns out to be the inaugural lecture of the year that Dr. Bashar is going to, going to give. I want to point out a couple of things. Is that what we're going to use this forum really to communicate some of the educational activities which have taken place inside the Heart and Vascular Center. And so our new program uh, this year that Dr. Lynn has put together is this Adult Congenital Heart Symposium. And as you can see, it begin, takes place on November 7th. Early next year, there's also going to be an Advanced Heart Failure Symposium. And so we're going to kind of use this to roll the educational products. And so the education arm of the Heart Center, we refer to as DICET, the Bakey Institute for Cardiovascular Education and Training. And you can see the website basically is up. We're, we've been given permission to start a YouTube channel, a Facebook site. So we're going to start pushing out more and more communication around the educational programs. And the Heart and Vascular Center Grand Rounds is an important part of this. We have been filming these. You, I wonder where's, you hold up your arm? Well, a great new addition this is going to help. I think everybody knows, um, knows them because he's been around here running the Grand Rounds for a long period of time. He's going to actually film this, edit it, and put it up so the Grand Rounds is, is available to everyone. So before we start today, it's my pleasure really to make an award. We started an award for, for quality this year. And uh, we call it the Heart Center Award for Champion in Quality. And I think we announced this earlier that the winner, come on up here, Sarah, was uh, Sarah Homer. Sarah, at that time, was actually off having a baby. <laughs> and so let me tell you about what the qualities of the person are. We're going to give this annually. It's kind of like the Noon Award. And the qualities for this were, number one, demonstrates compassion and concern for the individual needs of patients and families. Number two, fosters multidisciplinary team-based care delivery and accountability. Number three, institutes sustainable changes which result in positive quality improvement. And number four, exhibits leadership skills which encourage and empower uh, others to face challenges as individuals and as team members. And so this was a unanimous uh, decision uh, to give this to Sarah. Sarah really has been the director of quality, has headed up what I call hands-on quality programs. We've always had great ideas about how to improve quality. What we've lacked is the team of people who could actually descend into the ICUs, into the floors, and actually implement many of these changes. Sarah was a nurse practitioner and founder in ICU, and his frontline hands-on experience has really done a tremendous job in many aspects. ECMO quality, ECMO morbidity and mortality, uh, blood transfusion required basically with open heart surgery, uh, the duration of ventilation and post-op patients. These are all things that we are nationally evaluated on. All of them really have improved under Sarah's uh, leadership. So thank you very much for doing this, and it's a pleasure really to uh, give you this is the first award, and we will be giving this annually. So this is what it looks like, Sarah, if I ever get it out of the packaging. And let me just bring it out. And so it's to Sarah Homer, champion in quality. Thank you very much for all the people on the heart side. <laughs> With that, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Peden, who's going to introduce our speaker for this morning. All right, thank you and congratulations, Sarah. It's fantastic. Many more to come, I'm sure. Um, so this <coughs> morning, it's one of our locals that's going to talk to us. Uh, Carlos Bashara uh, came to us originally from Tulane, where he uh, battled with the hurricane the last days at Charity Hospital. Then came and joined us at Baylor, where he did his vascular surgery fellowship with us. Uh, then was with the VA for several years, uh, took over the residency program there, and has now come here as the head of the residency program for our vascular surgery fellows and integrated residency, and uh, integral part of the team, pushing our intervascular forefront for complex aneurysm disease, among other things, <coughs> vascular. Uh, and this morning, I'm going to talk to us about vascular infections, which uh, remain a, a real, real trouble to deal with. So, thank you very much, Carlos. <coughs> yeah, thanks, Eric. So, uh, see, I'm going to talk a little bit about the infections emanating from vascular surgery. Thanks. And, um, you know, I have nothing to disclose. You know, the hardest part about this presentation is actually getting cases together because I have zero infections. So I had to go to my partners and get cases so I can present <laughs> them today. So, so, all these cases belong to my partners. <laughs> So, I'm, so it's a big topic. Uh, so I'm just going to focus. I'm just going to focus on uh, basically aortic the infection because really, I mean, whenever we see an, an infection, whether it's an endograft or a graft, uh, I, you know, we worry about these cases or have a high morbidity and mortality. 
uh, talking about sand graft, how to diagnose these uh, patients, and I'm gonna talk about some treatment, some of the extra-atomic bypasses or inside to bypasses that we can do, and some stuff that we've done uh, as far as research work that we've done in the past and we're doing right now uh, to prevent some of these cases. So if you look at the overall incidence um, for graft infections, uh, you can see that the, the axillary baryphemal bypass and femoral bypass carry the highest, and that's part of it, you know, because you're working in the groin, it's not, it's not the cleanest area. Uh, meanwhile, if you look at carotid patch, it's very low. That's you know well in you know, a clean area. If you work in the neck, very vascularized area, so the risk of infection is very very low. And same thing for stem gut. So I was talking to some of the surgeons about these you know infections. I mean you know we see a lot of these groin infections. Obviously, when I was a baby, we had a huge problem. And you know we're talking about you know that really two, two things. One is adhering to aseptic techniques, and the other one is closure. I mean, maybe we're not doing a good job telling the residents how to open and close the groin, and I know that's part of it, but still, I mean, I don't think that's it, because if you look at some contemporary <coughs> data, I mean, this is published on the, uh, presented at the most recent SVS, and we were actually part of that study at the, at the uh, Houston when I was there. Um, so this included three major academic institutions, two in Boston, one in here. There was like 500 patients, and basically they looked at um, uh, putting a, a silver-based dressing at the end after you're closing the groin. And they still have 30% um, wound complication rate. I mean, this is this is recent. This published 2015. Uh, same thing, you know, uh, uh, Medical College uh, <coughs> Wisconsin. They looked at their data uh, over you know 100 patients, and uh, um, you know, it was a retrospective study. Uh, wasn't randomized like the previous one. This was again presented uh, two years ago, and they still have 22% risk of developing seroma, hematoma, and 31% of social, uh, uh, SSI skin and soft tissue infections. And when they did the multivariate and univariate analysis, and obviously, obviously they found that having a seroma and hematoma actually could lead to groin infection and skin and soft tissue infection. So it's a real problem. This is contemporary data. So we still, we still have a big, big problem to, to deal with. So, uh, so when we look at infection, we group them in early and late. So most people, some people use three months, four months, but I mean, this is from, from, the, from the Rutherford, where they usually use four months, and we call it an early infection if it happens within four months, and late if it happens four months after implantation of the graft. And then also we talk about uh, the uh, classification where we talk about the relationship um, to the uh, uh, post-operative wound infection. So we have grade one, if we just have cellulitis involving the wound, you know, and then if you go deeper into the tissue, we saw grade two, and grade three if it involves the, you know, the bypass or the prosthetic that you have in the groin or someone else. Now the extent of the graft involvement, so something called the bond classification, we don't, I mean, we don't really document all the stuff in, in the chart, but I guess it's important for, uh, for us to know, and also if, you, if you're doing some of the uh, 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 research project where you want to put some, some classification. But basically, I'll show some pictures uh, into each one, but P0, infection of a cavity graft, P1, a non-cavity graft, P, uh, P3, where the origin of the graft could be in a cavity uh, uh, location, and a patch infection, and aortoenteric uh, erosion of fistula, and aortic stump sepsis. Uh, which could be very, very devastating. So this is a P0 where you have, for example, aortic arch graft infections, or you could have abdominal thoracic aortic interposition graft infections, or like we talked about the iliac or the femoral ileofemoral infections. P1 is a lung cavity, you know, quick example if you have a forearm uh, AV graft, um, um, you know, or a fem-fem, or ax by fem or um, fem-distal bypass. Um, uh, P2, if you have an infection of an extra cavity portion of a graft that starts in the cavity uh, location, for example, a wartal bifem bypass, and you can see that the groins, there's a big abscess there, and you can see the infection in the groins. Um, and the same thing, like, for example, if you do an ascending bypass to the carotid, and if the neck, there's an infection in the, in the distal uh, anastomosis or the graft, but the proximal graft sits in the cavitary location. Patch, that's simple, you know, when you have like a carotid patch or femoral patch. Um, and then um, uh, this is an example of uh, a wart enteric fissure, uh, basic where you have the suture line eroding into the, um, um, uh, the uh, bowel as an example. And here if you are away from the suture line where you have graft enteric erosion where actually the, uh, the graft uh, and the, uh, there's a hole or fissure between the graft and the, um, and the bowel. So there's a lot of risk factors. Some, some of them is pre like we talked a little bit about it, is you know, pr prolonged uh, pre hospitalization. The patient, you know, usually be, might be colonized, especially if some of these drug-resistant infections. If you have an you know, infection in the remote site, you know, a lot of times we see patients, you know, might have, uh, you know, bacteremia from some other uh, problem, you know, uh, tooth abscess, and then the, whatever implants they have gets infected. Uh, you know, also recent percutaneous arterial access. Um, sometimes if you stick grafts, if the patient has a water wife on bypass, sometimes you have to stick it to procedures that could lead to infection. Obviously, break in aseptic techniques, emergency operations, 
Um, you know, that could be a, a problem. You know, for example, when we had the bleeding of AB fistula this weekend, we, you know, pretty much we had our hand on the bleeding ulcer in the fistula while we were prepping. So uh, you could imagine how difficult that could be. Uh, and then obviously reactive procedures, uh, because they don't heal as well as, um, um, as you know, when you're doing first time operation. Extended operation, always remember to redose your patient with antibiotics. You know, I think the anesthesiologists you do a good job reminding us or just doing it without us reminding them. If you do a concomitant, you know, GI or GU procedure, which these days we, we don't really uh, try to avoid that. Um, obviously, a possible complication, like we talked about, patient develops hematoma, hematoma gets infected, now the graft gets infected. So what about patient-related factors? So one, they could have malignancy, right? That, you know, they have their immuno, they're immunocompromised, or they have gluteoprofitative disorder, autoimmune disease, um, a, a corticosteroid administration, chemotherapy, malnutrition, diabetes, and chronic immune insufficiency and uh, liver disease and cirrhosis. So there's a lot of these uh, risk factors, and you know, just keep that in mind when you're doing some of these operations. So uh, some of these, um, you know, again, I'm just going to focus on a few things. One is, you know, like we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, perioperative <coughs> aseptic techniques is a, is a big deal. So that's why we have to be very careful how we prep the patient, how we conduct the operation to make sure that we don't have a break in the aseptic technique. You could have, like I said, seeding from uh, from bacteremia. Um, you know, patients come in, they're septic from, you know, they have pneumonia or something and then the graft gets seeded. Uh, or they could have mechanical erosion, like we um, like showed some of these uh, pictures, uh, like a word um, enteric uh, fistula. Or sometimes, you know, patient could develop diverticulitis, the colon is sitting next to the graft, and uh, we have like a, we call it kind of an extension of the infection into the graft. Or there's actually been reports, patients get um, um, colonoscopy and biopsy, and there's some reports that the graft of the graft getting infected just by, by doing that you know, the, 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 just a polypectomy, and you don't really think about it, it's been reported. Um, so bacteriology um, uh, actually has changed a little bit. The majority we used to see in the past gram-positive, but now we're seeing more and more, and I showed a little bit there when I was at the VM, we looked at the, at the uh, 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 bacteriology over there. Uh, but obviously still uh, gram-positive with staph, uh, uh, oris and now epidermis uh, being the most common. And the part of it I'll show in the next slide, because of these, these bacteria can form a biofilm. And actually that biofilm can be protective and they can just sit there, feed on their uh, gynocalyx where it has all the, all the nutrition and just years and years they might present with infection, you know, patient gets immunocompromised or they get sick for something else and then the in infection might manifest. Now, if you suspect a staph or this infection, um, um, uh, I'm sorry, epidermis infection, if you're gonna send the graft for, um, for culture, um, you have to request that you should you want a sonication technique where they actually kind of spin the graft so they can uh, break the biofilm and then uh, isolate those um, um, uh, uh, isolate the staff happy. And like I said, on the rise, we're seeing quite a bit of gram-negative uh, infections too. So this is just a sequence, you know, going from you know bacterial adhesion for whatever contamination that happens breaking aseptic techniques, and then you have uh, basically forming a microcolony. And then eventually they form the chirocalyx or the extracellular matrix, and then basically just sit there for years and years and years in that biofilm, um, uh, and then eventually cause infection. Uh, so this is a typical of staph epi infection. So let's talk a little bit about the graft, aortic graft infection. This is obviously a, a major problem, you know, loss of comorbidity and mortality associated with it. So the incidence could be up to um, uh, almost 4%, uh, big mortality uh, in, in some of these patients, especially if you have to like debris and get all the way close to the, to the renals, I'm gonna show a picture of that. Uh, limb loss up to 20%, and these patients could present, it's variable when they could present after the implantation of the graft. Like I said, especially if they have apiodermis, could be years and years after implantation of the graft that they could manifest. So history and uh, physics exam, so I always you know, ask the residents in conferences or when they present some of these cases, you always have to look for signs of failure of life because this is a chronic infection. The patients, you know, they come to you be like, you know, yeah, I have weight loss, I have no appetite, I feel weak all the time. You know, one patient I treated a couple of years ago, he actually was telling me he was falling asleep at work. He would go to work and just sleep, and even though he had a good night's sleep, he just feels tired all the time. That's because he had this infection in his uh, aortic femoral bypass. So imaging, uh, I'll, I'll show some, some data on some of the imaging, like CT, MR, ultrasounds, and, and PET scan. We're actually developing like a protocol at the VA for, uh, for leaving about PET scan and uh, radionuclide imaging, endoscopy. Uh, the management, well, depends. Is the graft open or is it occluded? Because if it's occluded infected, it's easy. You just take it out. But if it's open and it's infected, then you have to also worry about revascularization, which by far would be the most challenge uh, part of the operation, how would you re revascularize these patients in the field and infection, in the infected field. So, so this is actually a patient that I, I treated um, a, before, a few years ago, and uh, this is a, a good example where you have, you know, the, uh, the level of the renal aorta is open, then it occludes, and this actually patient came uh, to see me because every few months he has a draining sinus that they have to go to a local surgeon 
um, in the periphery and they just debrid it, close him, and then come back a few months later and then he came for a second opinion. So we explored it and sure enough, the graph was not incorporated at all. When we did the CAT scan, obviously we put some antibody bees with the CAT scan, you know, you can see there's, looks like there's some air or some bowel, maybe adhering to the graft. So when I told the family, this graft needs to come out, they're like, what, you can open up my belly again? They say, oh, there's like, yeah, you need it. And sure enough, we did, and it was pus. There was a lot of pus in the iliac limbs in the graft. Now the problem in this guy is we had to, we had to climb super renal and suture basically the aorta just below the renals. And then as you can see in this post up scan, I used felt to support the, the, uh, um, uh, the closure. And you know, obviously you worry, and we brought a piece of momentum and we put it over the stump because if this blows, the patient is dead. So, so you wanna make sure that you debris it to a nice healthy segment and then you do a good closure. So talk about failure of thrift. So look what happened to this patient. So I, I actually, was, uh, you know, he, I kept seeing him for a few months and then a year, a year and then I kept plotting his weight. And again, once we the graph was out, his appetite was better, he was eating more, he gained weight. And um, so again, just to show you that uh, this is one of the uh, presentations. So how about CAT scan? CAT scan is actually pretty good, has a very good sensitivity and specificity. Uh, the things we look for like uh, CAS, like we showed, perigraft fluid, um, uh, increase in soft tissue um, uh, surrounding the graft, uh, focal bowel thickening or false aneurysm. And this is what we call the halo sign. Um, and they can see there's, a, if you compare the two, I mean, you don't see it over there, but here there's uh, some thickening or maybe it's fibros fibrosis, you know, that's one tricky, but most likely it's this infection. And here you have a pseudoaneurysm. Whenever you see a pseudoaneurysm, you always have to worry about infection. Could be a tension, could be just weakening in the suture line, but also you always have to worry about there's a possible infection in, in um, some of these staph epi uh, infection. Again, um, MRI is pretty good to distinguish between fluid around the graft versus fibrosis. Um, and then also looking about perigraft uh, fluid and inflammation. It has good sensitivity, but again, specificity drops a little bit in MRI. Endoscopy is very good, and I'll show a picture uh, in certain situations where you can use it. Again, this is uh, where you can see um, here at the limbs, you can see there's, uh, uh, basically you can see there's some fluid around the graft versus just um, uh, fibrosis uh, based on MRI. Now endoscopy, if a patient comes in with GI bleed, again, we always tell residents something, you know, you have, have to ask about the history. If the patient has a wart of life on bypass, and they, had, uh, they have upper jaw bleeding, you have to make sure they don't have an aortic enteric fissure because that's a deadly uh, problem. So scope is very important. You wanna make sure you tell the GI doctor that they go to the third and fourth portion of the redeeming because that's where the most common location. And obviously you're looking sometimes for clot just sitting there or maybe you must have active bleeding, but please make sure you don't biopsy it because if you biopsy it, game over. Um, so, uh, but again, the key is you wanna make sure that the scope goes to the third and fourth portion of the redeeming. Um, uh, WBC scan, the radionuclear scan, again, has a pretty good um, uh, accuracy, 85, 95%. Uh, and geography, we don't really do it these days. I mean, you know, we have CTAs with 3D reconstruction, so we, we you know, that has replaced angiography uh, pretty much. So, like I said, when we were today, we were trying to develop a, a good protocol, because we really want to make sure, you know, sometimes we see a patient, for example, with a wart of bifam bypass. Is it the whole thing infected? Is it one of the limbs? So it's nice to have all this information so that we know how we can uh, fix the, the, the problem. So we tried to work on having a PET scan, and actually we, we were getting some good, good data um, on it, uh, working with the nuclear uh, imaging folks, where we, had a, we were achieving a, a sensi pretty good sensitivity, but specificity was still not, not that great, uh, but again, with the history and stuff, hopefully we were able to improve the positive predictive value to up to 87%, and the negative predictive value was almost 100% in, in these, in these uh, cases, and uh, eventually, I think that will be the, uh, probably the future gold standard test for these uh, infections. Now, how about when you explore them, like the patient I just talked about? Well, yeah, that's also been, that will give us, to help us with diagnosis, because sometimes if graft is not incorporated, you know that's infected. You know, all of us have been taking out grafts, um, you know, going into scar tissue, you know how, how you know, groins or other areas could be scarred down. But when you have an infection, I mean, that graft could just peel or peel off and, and take it out easily. Or if you see fluid, also that's a sign that there's infection. Or sometimes if you see bile stain, you know, you don't see an obvious hole in the colon, but obviously that's gonna tell you there's something there and you have to look further to make sure to look for the, for the hole in the, or, or the uh, communication. So uh, treatment principle, you wanna excise the infected graft. You wanna do what we call white debridement. Make sure all this tissue around, uh, surrounding the graft is, is clean and healthy and, and bleeding. Um, Re-establish vascular flow, and obviously this is by far would be the most challenging. I'll talk a little bit about some of the options. And the question is what we do for long-term uh, therapy. We don't really have a good guidance. Some people say lifelong, some people say six weeks, some people say six months. So we don't really have a good um, uh, guidance on, on as far as antibody goes. 
So these are the options. I'm just going to go through uh, uh, each one of them, uh, like, you know, uh, extra atomic bypass or some of the in situ um, uh, techniques that we have available and some graft preservation. So, for example, let's say the patient has an infected with the bypass. So the option is that, you know, you do an ax, you, you know, because this is an infected field, you go beyond the groin incisions, profundus, or maybe distal SFA or something, and you just do an ax. Uh, bifemoral bypass away from infection. So, um, so this is, you know, for the board for us, this is pretty much considered you now the gold standard, uh, but still has a high mortality and high risk of amputation. Uh, now, the issues to consider is, you know, time of revascularization. So, some people do what are called the traditional method, where they say they excise the infected graft and do immediately the um, the extraanatomic bypass, or they do the extraanatomic bypass followed by the excision, uh, but most commonly use something we call stage procedure. You know, as long as the patient's not bleeding and can wait, you know, you admit them, ICU, stabilize them, put them on IV antibiotics, take them, do an extra atomic bypass, put them back in ICU and keep them antibiotics and then bring them back and take out the infected, uh, infected field. So, um, alternative bypass, um, you know, I've, you know, been out for eight years, I've only done one. Basically what you do is you go between the adductor longus and the adductor magnus muscle. Um, uh, you know, the people advise actually to tunnel from below and coming up to avoid uh, injuries, um, uh, especially to, uh, to the bladder. And also you want to make sure you have a patent above the property vessel so you can tunnel the operative bypass. But it's a good bypass when you have groin infection because you're really away from it. You go to the external artery and just do your bypass um, over there. So um, uh, thoracal bifemoral bypass, again, it's a great operation. Today were, the guys are showing a thoracal abdominal um, um, approach for a ruptured aneurysm, um, and um, it's, it's a good operation. You know, you go to a nice, healthy, clean segments in the, um, in the chest, but again, it's a very morbid uh, procedure. Lots of risks like bleeding, infection, acute renal failure, uh, embolization, graft thrombosis, MI, pulmonary insufficiency, and intestinal ischemia, and actually in spinal ischemia because you're clamping up high in the chest. So Passerman at UAB, he actually looked at his, uh, looked at the data of 50 patients, uh, actually I'm not sure it was from UAB, but uh, looked at 50 patients um, uh, where they had good patency f at, at five years at 80%, 4% prior uh, optimal mortality and 60% complication. Obviously they expect the hospital stay and ICU stay to be prolonged in these uh, patients. So how about just taking out the graft and doing in situ? So instead of doing this extra time bypass, basically in situ in the same area where they had the infection, just clean it out and put a graft in, and, and fix it. So, um, so uh, Dr. Bandy, who actually, all, uh, you know, his career was based on, on vascular infection, the antibiotic beads, and um, uh, he actually looked at uh, 17 patients. Uh, they all underwent excision of the graft and they did in situ uh, repair. They had no period after death, and the reinfection rate was 22 percent at, uh, at 20 months. So, it's an, uh, so basically, they concluded that this is an, not, not a bad option for patients with low virulent infection. This way, you have to go and do this exatomic bypass. Um, uh, in these in these patients again another uh, study from from Europe uh, low you know small series again uh, 19 patients uh, majority of those were again low virulent uh, infections and uh, again they had pretty good results uh, with a, a no recurrent infection rate at 37 months uh, so then people said well if inside is working why don't we add some antibiotics to it and then maybe that will help and reduce the infection rate so that's how people now say okay well we can have rifampin um, um, to the um, uh, to the graft. So rifampin, typically we use it with, uh, with Dacron, and then again, for the residents, you know, obviously we also ask them that question, how come it works better with Dacron than PTFE? And that's because Dacron has a collagen or gelatin attached to it, and then basically rifampin attaches to the, to the, to the protein uh, molecule. So if you guys are gonna miss it, next time we ask you that question, we're gonna have to talk. So um, uh, now having said that, now there's some PTFE graphs that actually do have uh, some gelatin uh, 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 bound to it that you can actually use rifampin to also to PDFE. Uh, but again, it's, it's good, uh, it's a pretty good option against uh, staph um, epi and staph uh, oris, but not a very good uh, against MRSA uh, infection. So and then this is what happens when you uh, soak it, basically you put 600 milligrams of rifampin and you soak the graft for 15, 20 minutes, and then it turns orange like this, and then uh, basically use it. Uh, so uh, um, uh, Young at Mario Clinic, they looked at um, um, uh, uh, just using P regular PTFE for inside repair versus rifampin uh, salt graft. And uh, they still had the high overall infection rate of 22%, but it was much lower in the rifampin graft versus just the PTFE uh, graft. And you know, obviously they showed that it's a good option. So this is the study that showed that the uh, rifampin salt does not work against MRSA uh, related infections uh, based uh, out of the UK. And um, <coughs> so, 
I mean, sometimes we do it, but again, based on this uh, data, they're not saying say that it does not work very well. So Audrich at Mayo Clinic, uh, he looked at basic rifampicil graft versus axe by fan bypass, and obviously the uh, the patency and the uh, uh, risk of an, um, uh, you know mortality. Well, mortality was lower in the rifampicil graft we do in sat repair versus taking these patients with axe by fan bypass. And same thing for limb salvage um, at, at five years, it was much better with the rifampicil graft. So it's a good option in some of these infections. So this is actually an article that was published in the journal Infection that actually I got to uh, review before it was published. Um, so this group in uh, Halloun's lab, lab in, in, in France, what they basically patent first that they can bind, um, first up was binding cyclodextrin to, to Dacron and then binding antibiotics to the cyclodextrin. They were able to uh, patent that and then uh, basically they were able to bind rifampin, um, uh, uh, and vancomycin and cipro. And they tested, they did in vivo, um, um, uh, uh, studies on the um, on the DACM graft, and they did um, uh, in vitro and uh, in vivo with mice models, and they they actually showed some good results. Um, I don't know if this is projecting well, but basically, the, like I said, they test they test against Staph api, Staph aureus, and uh, Pseudomonas, uh, Amrase, Enterobacter, um, and um, uh, E. coli, and um, um, so obviously they use the gram negative. Um, um, graft, uh, sorry, it's not projecting well, but this is just the graft alone. Uh, this is the graft, I don't know why it's not projecting well, um, uh, with um, uh, rifampin and then some of the graft with, uh, with a cipro. Um, well, I'll just basically, basically what they showed is that it's, it's efficient in reducing the uh, adherence of the bacteria to the graft um, um, in, in uh, using those um, uh, antibiotics. So now the issue with that, you know, obviously what we, we Criticism for that paper is one, you're, you're only adhering one antibody, so what happens if you adhere two? Will they adhere? Will it work? We don't know. And also this is in mice, so we still don't know if this will work also in humans. And again, these days, you know, we're seeing more polymicrobial infection rather than just staph or, or pseudomonas, and then, so we probably need a mixture of both. But anyway, I think, I think that's, a, that's prob pro pro promising technology. How about allograft? Um, so basically, basically using cadaveric um, um, homograft, uh, this is an aorto iliac uh, segment, and this is probably an SFA uh, segment. Um, so, and then basically, you just take out the infected graft and then uh, put in the um, uh, the uh, allograft. Uh, so, um, Kiefer and JVS they published it in 2004. They had you know 179 patients, and they or th the 30 day mortality was 20 uh, percent with one year survival at 73 percent, and the um, uh, allograft. Related death death was in the decades at four three percent versus the cryopreserved death rate was uh, zero percent and they, they they had some problems how they process these uh, these material but now the the processing is, is is much better so we don't have any degeneration or blowout as we used to do in the, in the past uh, also actually the, um, Dr Zo and Dr Lumsen um, um, they looked at the um, uh, prospective study at three institutions where they had uh, forty two patients with cryopreserved uh, aortic allograft. Um, and then the 30 day mortality was 70%. They had non fatal complications, around 40 50%. And the majority was like local wound infection, DVT, you know, that's uh, six patients with amputations and renal failure required ulcers. And two, obviously, the length of stay was huge um, uh, 16 days plus or minus seven. And they had a good mean follow up of uh, 14 months. Uh, but they had no signs of allograft reinfection or allograft degeneration or disruption in this, uh, in this series. Um, just for sake of time, I'm going to just uh, skip this one. Uh, so this is uh, this is a, what we call in situ autologous uh, graft. So basically, we harvest the patient's deep venous system in the legs. Typically, for an aortic bypass, bypass, you're probably going to have to use both uh, use both legs. Uh, this was actually uh, uh, pioneered by Dr. Claggett in Dallas, and we call it the NACE procedure or the new aortoiliac uh, surgery procedure. Uh, so um, he um, when he um, uh, actually he had recently published uh, one of his fellows published the um, uh, recent more data a few years ago. But basically, they had a pretty good um, um, survival, 73%, and amputation rate of 5%, and the five-year graft latency, 83%. But the mean operative time was 11.5%. So, um, so that's a that's a long operation, obviously. And then I'll show some pictures uh, what takes really uh, the longest in this in this operation. So, um, the majority of the morbidity was uh, in the legs, 12% uh, fasciotomy and severe edema, and 10% of the patients. So these are some of the ways that you could reconstruct the veins, um, either do you know, a kind of like a wartel uni and the fem fem, or just bifurcate the graft depending how much length you have, or you think it's just a limb, it's in fact that you can just replace a limb. 
uh, basically you prep the patient from uh, basically from the nipples all the way down to the to the feet, and you harvest the deep uh, venous system, uh, and then you take it all the way up to the uh, profunda. Uh, and basically, you kind of take it off flush with the profunda because you want to leave like stump and then be a nidus for uh, clot and DVT, um, and then take out the vein and reconstruct it. So these are some of the ways that they could reconstruct the deep system and take out the graft. And uh, so how about antibiotic beads? So. So, uh, so that's something I was kind of interested in when I was a fellow, we did some cases uh, here, and then the one that went back and worked at the VA, so we looked at our, um, um, so first, first of all, the orthopedics has been doing this for longer than us, and actually, surprisingly, there's a lot of data on this, uh, on basically adding antibiotics to cement. Now, the key thing is, you have to remember, not any antibiotic you can, you can add to, these, uh, to, the, um, to the cement, because that's actually an exothermic reaction. When you combine them, actually, they're, they're, they're very, very warm, so you have to wait until they cool down before, uh, before you put them in. And then, not any, there's like certain antibiotics that you could add. And some of them that we usually use, most of the time, so when we looked at our data, um, is uh, basically topromycin and vancomycin. You can add flu fluconazole, also you can add, it's actually, uh, okay, it's a little bit resistant to the heat, and, uh, and gentamicin you can add. So, uh, so in, the, in our series, what we looked at 31 patients for 37 graft infection over five years. Like I said, the majority we use vancomycin and topromycin. And actually, they have a synergistic effect. So you want to use both initially, and then later you can you can tailor the treatment uh, for these patients. So, so the idea for the, for for use of the antibiotics read is one at least you can sterilize the wound if you want to do it inside to repair. At least the wound is sterilized. Or well, also we looked at that series of well, can we just salvage the graft? I mean, if we have a local infection, can we just salvage the graft and keep it the graft instead of um, uh, taken it out. Um, so we attempted that in 28 uh, graphs, and the reason for that is three patients, even though the cultures were coming negative, but we didn't see any good progress in the wound, so the suture line was still, you know, there's no granulation to show the suture line, uh, the graft is not incorporating, so so th that's the nice thing about this case, because you have, to, you have to put antibiotic beads and come back every, every um, you know, usually you want to wait at least the five days, because that's how long it takes for the, uh, for the plateau of the antibiotic release and the groin. So you write at least five to seven days before you take them back and take out the bees, because if you just take them a few days later, you didn't give the chance for the bees to release that antibiotic in the groin. So uh, because of these patients, we didn't see the good incorporation, but the cultures were negative. So what we did, we just resected the graft, and we did inside to repair with a muscle flap in these patients, and we have good, pretty good results with amputation, with one amputation, you know, 2.7% within 30 days, and limb salvage rate at, you know, at five years was 87.5%, and reinfection rate was 12.5%. Um, so basically what we did is that we formed an algorithm. So you have a patient that comes in with an infection, and then uh, what we, we basically, this was our protocol when we had these patients come in at TVA. So you take them, you explore them, you wash it out. If you take cultures, you wash them out, and then basically you put the beads. And typically what we do, we use, you know, except topromycin and, um, and uh, uh, vancomycin. Let us sit for probably five to seven days. And that's one thing I always warn the patient, that you have to be patient with us, it's a long process. You might be in the hospital for like two, three weeks, maybe longer, but they work. I mean, it works. Um, that's what Dr. Bandik showed. And then what we did is we took this further step. We were actually more aggressive in our treatment because, you know, we have a very sick patient population at the VA, and we, we wanted to basically use this for polymicrobial infection uh, instead of just, you know, the gram-positive uh, infections. So then we explore them, and sometimes on average, uh, the average take back was, around, if I remember well from the paper, was around 2.3 that we had to take them back uh, and then, you know, wash out the groin, replace antibiotic beads take new cultures, see if the, if the graft now is getting more and more incorporated, you see some granulation tissue. These are all signs that you're actually getting rid of the infection. And also we keep them on, on IV antibiotics until we have a, a bacteria with, uh, with the sensitivities that we actually tailor their antibiotic based on what they grow. And then basically we decide whether we're gonna do graft removal with immediate revascularization plus or minus muscle flap or just graft preservation with muscle flap. The, 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 the main criticism for the paper when we published it was why are you doing muscle flap? Well, I mean, this is, you know, sick patient populations. A lot of them are smokers, polymicrobial infections. So we want to throw everything at them that we have, like just antibiotic bees and, 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 and oral suppressive antibiotics. We want to make sure that we put a healthy vascular muscle to hopefully uh, treat this problem. Uh, because a lot of people say, well, you could just do the muscle flap and you're done. Uh, but again, that was, that was our response uh, to it. I'm going to talk real quick about something called ACEL. Uh, I should mention that this can be a little bit uh, off-label use because this is not approved for, um, for um, uh, topical use uh, right now. And, and Dr. Bismuth, uh, who you, you know, uh, probably all of you in the audience know, one of my partners, he actually, uh, with the residents, looked at the uh, ACEL data. So it's basically a powder that, at the time of the surgery that we've been putting in, putting in the wound, and basically it's made out of porcine uh, urinary bladder, and uh, it's an extracellular matrix that facilitates constructive remodeling and wound healing. It's, it has its own indications for use, 
But right now we're trying to actually um, uh, get use for um, the, for growing use. Uh, another area is to promote wound healing. So, uh, so uh, Dr. Bismuth and the fellows, the research fellows, and residents, they basically looked at uh, four-year data, and we had uh, 333 growing dissections, and they submitted this abstract to um, uh, to one of the national meetings this year. Uh, but what's interesting, what we found is that we pretty much were using ASAM in the ones that we were thinking of. So we, first of all, we were biased that we're using ASAM in the, the high-risk patients, reduce, you know, multiple previous graft uh, placement, and now we're putting more grafts, uh, smokers, diabetics. So, um, so, uh, so in, in, in general, we are using this material in the high-risk patient, and still, despite being the high-risk patient, what we've done is that we were able to reduce the deep infection. Uh, the, the superficial infection was the same between the two, the two groups, and part of it, you know, maybe because we're not applying it in all the layers when we close the groin, or maybe like most studies have done, the groin infection is actually the superficial infection probably is equal regardless of what you do, but, but if you can avoid a deep infection and exposing the graft, that's huge. So, but again, we can take this one step further. Uh, again, with, the, with, the, with Dr. Bismuth uh, 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 mentorship uh, with the residents, they actually now we're gonna hopefully run a multi-center randomized study with this, uh, with this powder and then see if it really, if it works or not. So again, this is a great idea for the, for the trainees. So, you know, you have an idea, you do retrospective view or small pilot study, and then after that, you follow with a, a multi-institution randomized study. So how about sun graft? Um, you know, we're doing more and more of these operations. We're gonna see more and more of these infections. Um, and then um, and basically the management is the same. You wanna, you know, debris the infection, take out the source and reestablish flow. So it doesn't really change, but usually when those happens is that those are actually a little bit of complexity because they're different with the uh, that the, the, the material that these grafts are made. So, uh, so this is actually the patient that uh, presented here from, uh, um, uh, to us. And then uh, patients, um, um, you know, I can't remember why he was bacteremic, but he had some, uh, some source of bacteremia. He had an enlarging sac, but no endoleak. So that's a concern. I mean, if you look at just in, in the less than, um, what, less than 10 days, you can see the sac went from normal, and now there's a, it's enlarging, and there's no endoleak. So that's a concern. Maybe there's an infection there, and he was having some back pain. So sure enough, he did have an infection, again, showing the enlargement of the sac. Um, and then basically, we took the patient uh, to the OR, so this is not the patient. This is, um, I'm just gonna show this slide because you know, we're talking about it in, in conference this morning with the residents. You know, we, we're, we're putting a lot of these graphs, not just we're putting these graphs these days. We're actually moving this graph up. We're doing fenestrations. We're putting sense in the realness. So in this case, in fact, you can see that the complexity of these operations is gonna be even more complex. And then, uh, and then this is actually the stand that has a super renal fixation. I don't know if you can actually see the, uh, the, the tip of those, but those actually have anchors and they're pretty sharp and they anchor in the intima. So if, you, if this gets infected, I mean, you don't want to just like rip it off um, um, and then cause damage to the to the intima. So the idea, what we've done, and I'll show you the video. You know, again, we didn't have the. Uh, you know, my, I see now why Dr. Lums like to like to uh, have intraoperative uh, images. Uh, so uh, we we didn't we didn't have it uh, when I did this a couple of years ago. But actually, I took out this graft for um, uh, for a type one endoleak, and um, so what we did basically in this case, which basically transected the graft here, and then um, you can't just grab this segment, so this is the head up here, you can just grab this segment and pull it out because one is adherent to the, to the wall of the, uh, to the intima. So what we've done is, this is 60 cc syringe, you just cut it in half, you put a Kelly, and then the idea is that you're gonna collapse the graft and then pull up, as you're basically sheathing the, uh, the graft in the syringe, you pull up so you get it off the wall and at the same time resheath it and you don't injure your gloves. So. The graft was so I had to do a bust when we, we just made this uh, use of like one of the used the uh, iPhone. Uh, and we grabbed uh, uh, it with uh, a video to, to show what we did. As you can see, we modified the syringe, body of the syringe. And what we did is we pulled it. So we basically pulled it and at the same time we pulled up on the syringe so we can we'll remove the hooks off the award. The form is to be able to resheath it and then also to protect yourself. So basically what we've done then, the, obviously the clamp was super renal and we just saw the graft to the inferior segment and we saw the, the short segment graft to the, to through the struts to give it some reinforcement and we finished the case. But these are, th these are things that, you know, just to show you that, you know, it's gonna add to the complexity of what we do to, the, uh, to these cases. So I think I'm almost done. So again, as you can tell, I mean, this is, this is a very uh, tough problem, especially those aortic graft infections. Um, they they're have high morbidity and mortality. Uh, the other issue uh, comes is what you do with long-term anti uh, oral antibiotics. I mean, like I said, we don't have really solid guidelines for how long you should treat them. Uh, but again, the principle is the same. Um, you know, you have to take out the infected source, clean the area, and, and reestablish flow. 
Um, and then, but again, I like everything else in, in medicine, prevention is key rather than, than treating the infection. So, that's Thank it. You. Thanks. So thank you, Carlos. But you've got a bunch of cardiologists sitting in the audience, and I want to make sure they get something very important out of this. The patient comes to Dr. Reisner, and he's got an aorta bifem, and he wants to do a coronary angiogram. Can he stack the graft? He can, he can stick the graft. One thing I would recommend, I mean, just to be on the safe side, I mean, maybe just use um, antibiotics, because I know, uh, I mean, we do it routinely uh, downstairs. I mean, I'm not sure in the cath lab if, if it's done. But I would say, yeah, give, give a dose of antibiotics, make sure. Um, you know, I'm sure there's no break in aseptic technique, and uh, yeah, uh, but there's always a risk sticking the graft. Is there a higher risk of infecting a graft, sticking a graft, than it is sticking a native artery? Mm -hmm. um, well, that's a good, that's a good question. I don't I'm think sure. it's ever been shown yeah. that there's an increased risk. Yeah. So I think you can stick yeah. these grafts, a lot more difficult to get in them, uh, but you can do it. Yeah. Number two, cardiologists start putting stent grafts. Guy's going to the dentist. What's he calls Dr. Reisner's office again and says, uh, I'm going to get a stent graft put in, what I need to tell the dentist. Yeah, so I would, I would like I said, there's some, some reports after polypectomy in the literature a patient having a stent graft infection. So for tooth abscess, I would say definitely get treated. But on the other hand, I understand that for the mechanical valve, I mean, that the guidelines re recently changed. I don't think they recommend you know, aggressive treatment like they used to do in the past, if, I, if, I, if I'm correct, you know? They changed it? I don't know. If you have prosthetic valve material, you still have from the director of the valve clinic, yeah. right from the horse's mouth. So what should we be telling them? What do you tell them? I, I, I don't know, I tell them. So actually, when a patient comes, I tell them, look, if you're gonna have some extensive, especially if you're gonna have extensive dental work or colon resection or something, just let us know, but you need to, you need to have, uh, I, I, would, I would have an antibiotic a few days, start take a few days before the operation and a few days after the operation. So I tell them, tell the dentist, it's essentially like a heart valve. I don't know that you need that, but, and the dentist is going to have no idea if you tell me you've got stent graft in your belly, but just tell them it's the equivalent of a heart valve and go ahead and prophylax them. And I basically yeah. say, I don't know that it's necessary, but I don't want to be the guy who actually proves the fact that you're going to get an infected stent graft from having your uh, teeth uh, intervened on. I'm going to tell another story first of all, and this was at Emory actually, and it was a patient who had an autobifem, um, had just not been doing very well, but he needed, he needed a cath, and he was cath through the right groin. And that whole groin blew up postoperatively and was grossly infected. The cardiologist got the blame for infecting the stink graft, for infecting the aorta bifem. I really don't think that's what happened. I think the, the patient had a subliminal chronic graft infection. And this poor guy happened to be the unlucky one who actually then put a, put a sheath in through the groin. And when, when Carlos says they're not incorporated, they're just kind of floating there. So there's potential space. So when you pull the sheath out, it just bleeds right up along the tunnel. And then it became obvious that it was infected. And so there was a big old lawsuit over this. The cardiologist stuck a graft. He got the graft infected. And so it's one of the reasons it's very relevant for you guys is if there's any question, if the groin's a little boggy, if it looks a little red, the patient's not doing very well, you want to stay away from it because you can, you can convert a chronic problem into an acute problem, and it looks like you're going to get the blame for it. Last thing, and then I'll get you up, John, is closure devices. Yeah. What about closure devices? You use a closure device and the groin comes along and it's all swollen and red and tender and yeah. draining. Now what? So, uh, so again, luckily we're seeing less and less of closure device because now we're using uh, monofilament sutures. Uh, you know, I use actually the ProStar, which uh, for my percutaneous evars and fenestrated cases, but still, luckily I haven't had any infections of braided, you know, because you have you worry about the braided sutures getting infections. Well, what if Dr. Reisner uses a closure device, now the groin comes back and Yeah, back. I mean, so you can use the closure device on Dacron, actually. On PDFE, I don't recommend it. If the patient has PDFE, I don't recommend sticking the PDFE and use the closure device. But for Dacron, I've used it, I've done it, used the, but I use a suture-based closure device. Uh, I don't use, uh, you know, collagen-based. So if you use, like, ProGlide, for, forget the fact that there's a yeah. graft in there. It's a native artery and he's put a closure device in it and it comes back to you and it's red and draining. Oh yeah. What are you well, going to do? Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to debride that, debride that groin and uh, depending on how bad the infection is, replace it with something. Like so, the, so the problem is it's not just IND. Usually yeah. the artery is infected. Mm -hmm. And usually you have to resect the artery and replace the artery. So these groin closure devices, much less common than they used to be because of exactly what uh, Dr. Bachata is saying. Braided suture means it's like a piece of string and twine, a bunch of stuff in there, bugs go right down them. The monofilament is a solid piece of material. Bugs don't track up it nearly as well. So it's less of a problem and less of a concern when they get infected. But an infected groin with a closure device, 
that's a whole different ball game because the front of the artery is rotten you just can't sew on these things it means you're usually going to resect the artery and then you got to put a piece of vein in there which tends to blow out when you put them back in an infected groin so these are these are the vascular graft infections are very and vascular infections are very difficult to handle john <coughs> dr cook thanks for a great talk i learned a lot from that thank you um could you tell us a little bit about what we're doing here at methodist in terms of uh addressing this issue and I'm referring to uh, some of the work that Dr. Peden has done with NO releasing graphs it, it, or if you're aware of that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Dr. No. Peden is still here but perhaps you could. With a, sorry, which graph? Yeah, I mean, so again, Dr. Peden's interest is in dialysis access. Uh, if you're looking for a model of re stenosis or graft infection, you got it. That, that's what it is. I mean, there's no way else you put a graft in artificial graft in, in many cases, then send them off to some unit somewhere to have it punctured with two needles three times a week, and they get infected. So the, the problems are re at the venous anastomosis. The single most aggressive re lesion ever described occurs at the venous anastomosis of an AV graft. And so it's a great model for studying anti re strategies. That's really what the NO delivery systems are about, is about re -stenosis. But there's also antibiotic delivery systems to try and suppress the incidence of infection that occurs in these grafts. So I don't know really um, what the outcomes of this are, but you know, you, Carlos touched a little bit. You started talking about drug delivery through grafts. I mean, if you can put drugs in a stand, how come we can't load these grafts with them and try to mitigate some of these complications? You know, listening to your talk, Carlos, uh, that, that's a, a brilliant idea to have a nitric oxide releasing graft because. And nitric oxide under certain conditions, particularly conditions in the setting of an infection under oxidative stress forms peroxynitrate anion, mm -hmm. which is uh, highly cytotoxic. Uh, so it's antibacterial. And it also, um, as we know, it inhibits uh, re stenosis, it inhibits vascular muscle cell proliferation. And the other thing that occurred to me when you were talking, you talked about the biofilm. Uh, nitric oxide is a very small molecule. The biofilms are very good at keeping drugs out. But it'd be interesting to see, uh, to do some work uh, to see if uh, NO is. Uh, uh, permeable through the biofilm, I bet it is. That's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, that's if you, if you that's a great idea because I mean that's a staph I think is one of the most common uh, problem infection that we see these days. Right? So, so, is it only vascular grafts that get infected? Stents get infected? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, no stents. I mean up to one percent, one to two percent. Yeah, stent grafts could get infected. No, I never said stent grafts. Stents. Oh, stents. I want to know about oh. st a lot of people putting a lot yeah. of stents in a lot of places. Did they ever get infected? <laughs> Only when they're put in by a vascular surgeon. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, no, we, we've, uh, I mean, there's few, actually, on, honestly, on, on the vascular boards, we got one with a bare metal stent in the iliac that got infected. Uh, I can tell you that wasn't a good good case, to, to, but we got one. I got it on the auto boards. So, uh, no, I mean, they happen, but they're uh, not as common. Yeah, not as common. Yeah, so, very, pretty uncommon. <coughs> they tend to happen when you go back in, like you put in lytic therapy catheters through a stent because it's occluded and you leave them in for like two days. That's the kind of situation, but it happens. They should be aware of it. It doesn't happen very often, but man, it is a bad problem when it actually happens. The other thing is you mentioned um, uh, aorta duodenal fistula. And again, for the cardiologist, a patient who has an aortic, you mentioned the Dacron grafts and PDFE grafts. You didn't say whether or not stent grafts can cause aorta duodenal fistula. So it does. I mean, this, uh, the way these stent grafts actually uh, stay in, in, uh, in uh, put is actually they have radio force, and you know, and also we think with that radio force and the uh, on having the duodenum. Uh, no, we've seen it. We've seen. Now it's not as common uh, for some reason. I mean, maybe part because you don't have a suture line on the outside. Um, you don't create as much scar tissue. Uh, you know, when you do the open surgery, and then um, you know, sometimes we're stuck. We can't put the um, like a. a, a this, you can't close the retroperitoneum really well. You know, sometimes when I do open a vortex surgery, if I have a young guy and I can't please, uh, close the retroperitoneum, actually I put a piece of uh, omentum uh, to cover the graft because, you know, you're, they're young, you know, they're going to probably have this graft for, for 10, 20, 30 years, and uh, so you don't have that problem. So, uh, yeah, but not as common for, for some yeah. reason with stem graft. So the omentum is referred to in the British surgical literature, which Mahesh knows about, as the abdominal policeman. Whenever there's infection, like your appendix, all of a sudden the amenum is down and wraps around it. There's infection, sigmoid, sigmoid column for diverticulitis, the amenum kind of goes down there and wraps around it. So we use the amenum if we're worried about something eroding or infection. We take the amenum down and wrap it around the graft to try and stop it. Dr. Ramos, that was a great talk and a very, very difficult, challenging problem to deal with. Uh, 
So you, you, you outlined a variety of options that are available. Uh, suppose you were presented with a patient today who had an aortic graft infection from an aortic femoral graft. Uh, graft. Walk us through your thought process and which of these options you would choose for that patient. How do you go about deciding sure. what you're going to do for yeah. that patient? Uh, I, mean, I think one bit is you're going to see how they're presenting. I mean, if they're, like the patient I showed failure with the flag, you know, they have one of these like chronic uh, inland infections, I'll probably just take it out and do refempin soak inside to repair. But if the patient is sick and shock, um, then you probably would just want to debrief everything uh, and then do an extra, extra atomic bypass. So it depends on if you know what you're dealing with. And typically you can tell. I mean, the patient is sick, like, you know, we had a patient come recently from a uh, hospital. You know there's going to be pus, you're going to be, you're probably going to be gram-negative infection there. So if, if you suspect that, I probably will not do an insight repair in those cases. I'll probably just clean out the area. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you, you really should, you debris up to like healthy aortic tissue, because if you have aortic stump blowout, 80% mortality. So, uh, so that's an issue. So that, that would become one issue for, for dealing with the stump. But if you choose to uh, excise the infected graft and you have to revascularize, um, how do you choose between, uh, uh, you know, a homologous graft yeah. or autologous graft or antibiotic impregnated graft? I mean, yeah. what, what do you think about when you make those choices? Well, like I said, depending on the, on the bacteria. Like if it's in the gram negative, I won't even do it inside to repair. I'll just do an extra atomic bypass. Now, if it's a, a staph uh, infection, I'll probably do just in a background with a refampant salt graft and do an inside to repair. Um, or, um, you know, if you're going to do home graft, you know, just want to make sure that you also put some, uh, regardless when you do it for the inside, you just bring some momentum and do it, um, uh, do, a, do a momentum repair over it. So, I mean, honestly, it depends also on, 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 the, on the bacteria a lot. Over it. Sometimes you don't know, but you can tell from the way the patient is presenting uh, if it's a gram negative or gram positive infection. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here.